Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's about, it's the top of the hour, so we're just going to get started. I'm Joanne Baumgartner with the Wild Farm Alliance. I'm uh, based in Watsonville, California, and today we're excited to share with you uh, our latest resource, which is increasing farm diversity, hedgerows, windbreaks, and riparian areas. It's about a timeline and steps for putting in those conservation practices. So it's a real how-to document. And um, Sam Earnshaw mostly wrote it, who's Sam's my husband, and he's going to be presenting uh, now the first half of the hour on that document. Then I'm going to be presenting after him on a nesting structures document that we published earlier this year. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about our more recently published habitat assessment and native plant guide for birds. So it's all about supporting um, these organisms on the farm that can help us with pest control and the hedgerows and other habitat with pollination and lots of or many different um, uh, benefits come from these plantings. So uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll answer them at the end of each presentation. And then um, uh, what else? There'll be a final poll at the end. There'll be four questions and they uh, are just asking, how do we do? And if there's anything else you want to share. So um, I am going to hand it over to Sam. <laughs> and uh, Sam, you're with Hedros and Lemonade. Get the thing go. Oh, yeah. Um, Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. I'm going to get the presentation uh, sh um, shared. So we're going to talk about some of the things that we've learned over the last 25 years working on this. I worked for CAF for a long community alliance with family farmers, and we got funding to uh, install hedgerows on farms. So um, one of the, um, the way, some of the ways that farmers use conservation plantings is with hedgerows, grass waterways, filter strips, riparian plantings, windbreaks, and beetle banks. And we're going to talk about some of those. That's a native plant hedgerow, grass waterway, on a strawberry farm, um, a filter strip next to a um, crop, between a crop and a hedgerow, uh, wind breaks, um, a beetle bank is where is a, a grassy area where these predaceous beetles are able to live and work, and then a uh, riparian area. Um, so the functions of these plantings are many, and just real quickly to run over them <clears throat> to remember soil erosion control, weed control, beneficial insect and pollinator habitat, wildlife habitat, they sequester carbon, non-point source water pollution reduction, air quality and dust control. <clears throat> they provide barriers as living fences, uh, riparian stabilization, windbreak and climate modification, aesthetic value, economic returns, and increase in local and regional biodiversity. Um, they, this, these, many of these functions overlap on, on really thinking about climate change and how they can buffer climate change, the protecting soils, increasing the water infiltration, controlling erosion, creating habitat for as the climate changes and, ha and insects and wildlife move, um, sequestering carbon, protecting from winds and climate and increasing biodiversity. So um, you all have heard, I'm sure, of hedgerows in England, where th at one time they had 500,000 miles of hedgerows. Um, and Wild Farm Alliance has a, a vision of trying to create 500,000 miles of hedgerows here in the United States, um, surrounding farms, 10 acre farms with hedgerows. So we're on the way to that. I don't know how close we are, but we're getting there. Um, as you know, also in the 30s, this cloud of dust actually rolled into Washington, D.C. when Congress was voting on creating the Soil Conservation Service. Um, 
and a lot of the work has come out of NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Now, um, John Anderson was one of the pioneers in doing hedgerows in, in YOLO, and you'll hear a little bit more about him throughout this, but he was our mentor and we learned so much from him. He wrote a document, Bringing Farm Edges Back to Life. Um, so in California, there are these um, climate life zones and you can see this, um, upper Sonoran zone where the elevation rainfall climate and biota are essentially in the same range. And that allows us to use many native plants in, in many areas throughout the state. Uh, we did a hedgerow, we, we, I was in Los Angeles at an Audubon brand new hedgerow and they were using the same plants there that we use up here in Marin, in, San, in, in uh, Santa Cruz County, Marin, even as far north as Humboldt. So, that gives us a great ability to use lots of different native plants. And um, so many of the non-native plants are planted around you. People take them for granted, but they have been brought in specifically because they don't have insects on them. And because they don't have insects on them, the birds don't have anything to eat or do the predations bene uh, beneficial insects. So we really try to um, use native plants all the time. Um, Oak tree is a great example, and putting oaks in these plantings also is is great. They um, this is just a chart of some of the things associated with it, that golden leaf oak, that gold cup oak. But on the one side is the acorns, leaves, limbs, trunk, and roots, and then across the rest of the chart is the insects and the birds and all the different things associated with that one tree. So um, it's something you don't really realize till you see a chart like this. At least I didn't. Um, Native Plant Nurseries, this um, website up at the top, Calscape, is uh, run by the California Native Plant Society, and it lists by region where you can get these native plants um, and where places to plant hedgerows. There's so many different places, but along fences, along roads. Um, here's a hedgerow along a roadway on a farm in San Juan Batista. Um, there's you can use different size plants. This is a that was a weed patch for the grower, and we replaced the weeds, the annual weeds, with these perennial shrubs, and they can be low. There's yarrows, um, and there, the varieties like coffee berry and sages and cenothus have low growing, and manzanita have low growing varieties, and that's what we used in this particular hedgerow. Um, they can be provide dust control, which for some crops is really important, and for most crops it's important, some for specific issues, but this was a road where a lot of dust was coming off. Um, so in these plantings, we try to use a lot of different plants that have a um, blooming, get, so there's blooming available, nectar and pollen available for the insects for 12 months a year. And with a with a whole range of different plants, you can get that. And it's an important thing to keep in mind. Transporting plants from the nursery is kind of taking a little bit of years to figure out how to do it without blowing the plants all apart with the wind, but I take a, a tarp and lay the front of it in the very front of the truck and then throw it over the top of the truck, put all the plants in sideways and then pull the, tr the tarp back over them and just keep it down with some heavy objects or rope or chains or something. But that's really very effective. It doesn't hurt the plants, but you have to put the fragile ones kind of on the top layer, of course, like sages, they're very fragile, but you can do it as long as they're not crushed. And then when you get to the farm, you divide them all up into uh, by species and where they're, then where they're going to go out onto the beds. Um, and making a high bed is something that, you know, I've really learned it makes a big difference in the plants. They like to have their root crowns like to have aeration during the summer when they're getting water. And um, it's just it seems to be a successful thing. We always try to make some kind of a berm a bed for them. Um, some farmers will put two, two rows of hedgerows, and this one on the bottom right is a three rows hedgerow if there's space available. Um, and this farmer takes ground out to do this because he values these things. And getting ready to plant, you dig the holes. The holes aren't too big. You can see the guy on the left is putting some compost in the hole. We put a little compost, not fertilizer, 
fertilizer will make these plants grow too fast and fall over. They're, they're really chaparral plants. They're not used to getting high fertilizer unless the soil is really sterile. Um, and then watering, we really like to soak the, the plants, the, the holes before we plant. There's, this one on the left is a water wand that uh, almond grower was using and then just ordinarily water truck. And you can see that we, we fill the holes completely with water and let the, let the um, and put the plants in. They get off to a good start. The drip irrigation just kind of keeps it going that way, but getting them off to a really good wet start is really important. Um, and just laying out the plants and putting compost in. Um, and then one of the things that we do is some of the plants are definitely survivors. You know, no matter what you do to them, they're going to live. And coyote brush is one of those. Quail bush is one, coffee berry. Um, so what we'll do is take those and put them all, distribute them all through the planting at the very beginning. So from you, from the beginning to the end, there'll be those strong plants will be across, along the entire planting. And then we come back and fill in with some of the other ones that mostly survive, but you know, putting we call them backbone plants or survivor plants. And sometimes um, uh, not on all the plantings, but sometimes we'll use these gopher baskets when gophers are really a problem. Um, most growers will just trap for them, but sometimes you go to a site and there's just gopher holes everywhere. And so, and you can see this this one in the front is a it's called a speed basket. It's like a little ski cap. It's they're stainless steel. You put the plant in them and just pull it up. It's very fast. It's a lot easier to use than the old fashioned chicken wire ones. Um, and then time to plant. We take the plant carefully out of the thing, make sure it's not root bound. If the roots are circulating around the pot, that the plants won't grow anywhere. So we kind of loosen them up, give them a chance to take off on their own. Um, and we we'll use the ir irrigation tubing and then we'll put emitters on each side of the plant. You can see here on the about six inches from the center. And that's another lesson learned the hard way. You'd put a emitter right where the plant is and you come out in a week or two and look at it and the emitter has, the tubing is contracted or expanded and so the emitter isn't anywhere near it. So this gives a wider root zone and kind of always assurance that the plants are gonna be getting water. Um, also, sometimes there's pest issues, of course, and this one up on the right, that. Um, that was a hedge we planted where the rabbit, we, the grower wasn't really coming out and looking at it afterwards. And the rabbits ate the entire hedgerow down to the ground. And that, what you're looking at there was, it was 100% replanted with these little three foot chicken wire baskets. And that works it, now that the thing is growing. And on the right, if you look way in the distance, that was a mound of soil that was moved by a Caltrans and it turned into a ground squirrel hotel. There were literally thousands of ground squirrels there. And we planted this hedgerow here and they started coming in. And so one technique we learned, if you give, put a barrier up, they don't, they, they like to be able to see. And so if they can't see, they won't, they won't, aren't a problem. And so with that um, barrier, we were able to get that hedgerow up and running after a, they got hit pretty hard. Um, and, to control weeds uh, in a hotter area, you can use solarization with this had, this was done in the summer in Madeira. It was drip lines underneath there. And this, you see these green weeds in the front, the whole bed would have looked like that if it would, hadn't been solarized. Um, mulch is another technique. It's the most used technique to keep the weeds down. And this planting here was that was planted into that mulch. That was eucalyptus mulch, incidentally. And eucalyptus is very good. It's not allelopathic for plants that are in gallon containers and stuff, but that was the mulch. And there it was planted. That was six months after the planting. It kind of shows how fast these plants can grow. Um, some growers will use weed cloth or or wheat or um what they call the plastic mulch, which not preferred because it stays out there and it keeps plants from spreading, but it definitely does the weeds. So some people just do it. Um, it's not done that often, but it's a it's another alternative. But the mulch is really good. It smothers the weeds. It keeps mo moisture in. This was one of the plantings we did. This isn't your everyday mulch application. Um, 
but we put you can see we put buckets over the plants and then mulch but more generally it's done with with just piles and wheelbarrows in a really strong weedy area you can put cart this cardboard down and then put mulch on top of it um, and then occasionally you do have to replant and this is just a picture of a hedgerow where we did a this was an older hedgerow but it had some holes and we came back and did a replant so some of the things to 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 we're concerned about is you know this this shows a, a rabbit ate a hole in that irrigation tubing and we ended up lifting the the tubing up about four or five feet above but just monitoring this stuff all the time the animal pressure um deer can be a problem you need taller taller staked um, cages with the deer. And then here are the things to maintain the irrigation system, to remove the weeds, control rodents. There's Joanne over there digging, working hard on her. <laughs> uh, replant when necessary and track the plants. And you can do it with um, charts and photography as well. And just to show these plants really can grow um, fast. This is one year of growth. And this is eight years later on the same planting. Um, this windbreaks is another conservation planting that is is done, and it's taller trees and takes wider areas, um, riparian areas. Again, with with the right water, they'll be pretty rapid grow. That's a Fremont cottonwood there that was just a one gallon plant a, a, almost a year earlier. Um, this was a John Anderson riparian planting in Yolo. This picture was taken from the looking upstream and looking downstream, but you can see how important it is, how good it can be to bring biodiversity to an area with with the native plants versus just a, the canal banks, which they just keep scraped. Um, I'm just gonna. That's pretty much the nuts and bolts of how you do this. I'm gonna just run through some of the. Um, other things associated with beneficial species. There's lots of science showing all the different uh, beneficial insects associated with these plants. Um, wasps are tremendous uh, predators and parasites. Uh, um, beneficial insects, ladybugs, spiders, assassin beetles, lace wings, thurfid, surfid flies. And the, the wasps just lay their eggs on caterpillars, and, and that's a aphid mummies there on the right. And this shows how with a this six, this is a chart showing from June to October on um, six native plant species, how many different wasps came in on all these different plants. If you just had one species of plant, you wouldn't get that. And the same with this, this is showing the lace wings on these different plants. So it's a great example of why and how important it is to have many, many plants there. The lysum, sweet alyssum, is used a lot in these fields to bring into kinid flies and also um, the, hub, the hub flies, and then um, also other pollinators and beneficial insects. It's used by many organic growers. Joanne's going to talk a lot about birds. So I just threw a few birds on the farmers a lot of times say birds are a problem. Well, what Wild farm is helping educate. Birds are great, beneficial. They eat tons of insects that, um, and they can control a lot of those um, uh, pests there. Nest boxes, uh, wild farm's been putting up like hundreds of nest boxes on farms, um, owl boxes. This was Steve Simmons. He was a Merced shop teacher and he had the kids buy, building owl boxes, but he, we went on a field day and he crawled up this ladder and pulled out an owl, then he pulled out baby owls, and then he pulled out a gopher. So um, there, are a lot of, lot, there are lots of owl boxes being used. Um, bluebirds eat a lot of caterpillars. There's a heron with a gopher, the hawks with the mice, and perches. They're, they're easy to put up and they, they really find a, give a place for the hawks to live. This was a perch with the manzanita branch on it. I kind of like that one. It's kind of a little different than just a two by four or a post. Um, and then, of course, we know that a lot of these plants attract the bees with the flowering and a lot of pollinator and the 
the, a lot of the growers are putting these plants to almond growers and others are putting them into bring in the bees. Bees increase yields. There's um, that this was the hedgerow we planted in in Fireball. And you can see in the back, there's the hedgerow. Well, the grower was, was paying to have bees and the beekeeper uh, reduced his um, fees by like $4,000 because he was able to leave his hives there much longer than they usually did because the bees were using these plants so much. And that was a place where one time I saw a coyote brush that had so many bees on it, you couldn't even see the leaves. So um, it just is good to really see that. Um, and Xerxes Society and others are great sources of information on the pollinators. We don't get these too often in our hedgerows, but the point being that they do bring in habitat. This is a court. You can see there's a vegetated strip that's not scraped bare and creating corridors is what we try to do. Um, you can get some problems with these, but they're all kind of, um, there's no silver bullets in agriculture. And so the hedgerows and benefits seem to outweigh it. This was the, the food safety spinach thing. Um, Snakes, the farm workers like to kill snakes and we tell them that um, snakes actually eat rodents. There's a rattlesnake eating a squirrel, but we don't get rattlesnakes too often, but nevertheless, it's an example of just, they really are helpful. That's John Anderson. Um, so the food safety thing is important and the things to consider is the number of animals, the type of animals, the type of crop, the harvest procedure, neighboring influences, the pathogen of concern, and additional processing. And the important thing is this monitor the crop, not the habitat. There's a lot of science has been sh recently shown that the, ha the healthy habitat will actually reduce the pathogens, not increase them. And the auditors and buyers and the people who do the salad mix in the big industrial farms really need to learn that because they're basically, they need to learn the values of habitat. And some of the things that um, farmers use are these frog fences, they call them around the crops to make it seem like nothing can get in there. And just a quick run through some plants with grasses, this erosion can be a huge problem. And this is a good slide of the perennial roots, how they can really stabilize the soil. And this is places where grasses have been planted uh, with, with uh, straw on the seed. And this is putting plugs into an eroding dish. That was that ditch was eroded and was plugged. This was another one. If on the right, you can see that was done with drip irrigation and seed and then covered with straw. And then it came up really well. Um, looking upstream and downstream, two different kind, this exact same ditch, just vegetated. This grower was going to put a $30,000 steel pipe down the middle, and we did with vegetation. He tried vegetation instead. We had a big storm come in. The next day, it looked good. It, so the vegetation can really work for controlling that kind of erosion. Deer grass makes a nice hedge, um, contracts ladybugs and spiders. Um, and this was a thing with willows in an eroding ditch. This, this willows would grow into trees if you left them, but we just put, you, you cut the thing, you, you, you soak the, the branch for a month and then put it in the ground and it'll grow. And then he comes and prunes the top of this every year. So it's a great way to manage that kind of erosion that before on the rough of life up of the left, you can see is not getting managed at all. Sometimes we've had kids help us plant, which is really fun and educational for everybody, them and us. NRCS is a great resource for us. Um, and all, they've got cost share programs. This is, that's John Anderson's publication on the left, Bring Farm Engines Back to Life, the Atra one. This is a one that we put together in 2018, available on CAF and on my website. And then that's Joanne's Wild Farm a beneficial bird book on the left. So back to hedgerows, 500,000 miles of them. Um, that's the Salinas Valley, not too many hedgerows, but ALBA was a, is a, a nonprofit agricultural land-based association in Salinas who had did some work with hedgerows and that's what it could look like. That could look more like that. So that's the end. And that's just a quick trip through the world of conservation plantings and hedgerows and windbreaks so all right thank you sam 
Um, I think what we're going to do now is um, here to, there, it looks like there's a bunch of stuff, a uh, bunch of questions in the chat and Shelly was going to help us go over those. So do we have time? Yeah. We've got yeah. Um, there were about four questions, Sam, for you that came in during your talk. Um, so the first one was uh, that you were talking about planting hedgerows on mounded um, earth and um, Cammie was wondering why that was recommended because uh, I guess she was thinking that mounding would not help with uh, drought resistance. Can you address that? Well, the plants should be watered. So they're going to get the irrigation tubing is on top is is where the roots are. The, what we found is when it's flat and does it's the aeration. The roots really like to the the crowns of plants don't like to get soaked in water, and so it's basically just a question of air of aeration. And it's just something I've seen really work. You know that that the plants do so much better when they're up on a mound. And it, as we drive into the Central Valley where it's really hot, you'll see. Most of the orchards are planted up on mounds. They're not flat on the ground. So it's it's a it's a question of aeration and they still will be able to get water because the tubing and the irrigation system is there. Great. Um, let's see, the next question is about invasive plants. And so if you're removing invasive plants um, as part of the site preparation, uh, would you recommend chipping and mulching them and using them as part of the soil amend amendment to plant in? Yeah, assuming no weeding, assuming they're not weedy species. They don't have seeds and it depends. I mean, it's generally woody material is used as a mulch. It's like the tree, We a lot of people get the tree trimming companies to drop big loads there that they don't have to take them to the dump and pay for them. But it's if it's woody, it doesn't. Yeah, it should be okay as long as there's not a lot of seed material in it and active roots that could take off. Yeah, that should be okay. Great. Uh, let's see. The next question was um, about species that um, were used um, for seeding the grassed waterways. Do you have any ideas on um, what species were used? Well, there's a lot of native grasses that are used for different situations and there's lists and there's sources and if somebody wants to contact me afterwards I can help them with that I mean I've learned about that too one time we we at first we were always using this creeping wild rye which is a wonderful native plant it grows many areas all over the state we put it along the this this ditch next to a strawberry field and one time we went by there and the farmer had had to have his farm workers in there cutting these gigantic growths of this thing down that it turned into be, it was way too aggressive for the um, situation, but, the, but and it's good in some places, but it's like, so it's, again, it's no one grass will work in every situation, but there's a great, there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of information about the different native grasses, the bunch grasses and the you know, one of my favorites is the red fescue, which is low and it, it grows in a lot of situations and it's, it's, it's a rhizomatous, so it spreads. And so you can put plugs in and then it'll spread and cover it. But yeah, if, you, if someone wants to contact me, I got all kinds of lists and they're easy to find information on that. Share your email address. What? Share your email address with them. Yeah, you can email me at hedgerows at baymoon.com. Hedgerows at baymoon.com. Great. I think um, that's it for the questions. There were a couple others, but um, they're uh, mostly about birds. So I'm going to save those for Joanne's um, oh, Q&A. But thank you, welcome. Sam. You're welcome. All right. OK, we're going to switch gears. And I'm going to talk uh, first about our nesting structures publication. and. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm first going to talk about nesting structures and how they and why we want to put them up so we can support beneficial birds. Um, then I'm going to talk about what birds need, 
some concerns we should consider when placing a box, how to maintain that box, and how to manage threats to the birds in the box. Um, and I'm going to be referring somewhat to this publication, Nesting Structures for Beneficial Songbirds. <laughs> there are <clears throat> um, other materials on our website for um, barn owls, or at least for building barn owl boxes. Um, and but this talk is just for mainly for songbirds. So a lot of birds are cavity nesters. And in order to use a nest box, they need to be cavity nesters. But when I'm talking about structures, I also mean birds that could be using shelves in barns and or nesting under the eaves of buildings. And this chestnut back chickadee has a nest right there in this apple orchard and our, our apple tree. And the um, there's been a bunch of studies showing that Birds help with reducing codling moth, which uh, in apple orchards and in walnut orchards. And um, one of those studies was mine. Um, and one of the birds was uh, chestnut back chickadees. This chickadee with its beak full of insects was just getting ready to go into um, its nest to feed its nestling, its seven nestlings, which that's a lot of food they have to um, provide for their chicks every um, throughout the day. There's also um, studies with birds related to chickadees that bird, these um, blue and great tits that live in Europe and um, researchers have put up nest boxes to support them <clears throat> and found that when with those nest boxes, they have increased apple yields um, and have shown a reduction in apple pests. And in another study, just great tits, they showed a reduction in um, pest insects in wine grapes, peaches, prunes, and pears. And these studies, uh, I'm just mentioning a very few of the hundreds and hundreds of studies that have been done, actually thousands of reports have been made over the last 140 years about avian pest control and how beneficial birds can be. Um, the, I'm sharing this slide about barn swallows because they nest inside barns, not in nest boxes. And, and this study showed how they helped reduce pests in oil seed rape fields. Uh, and this study showed how they reduced pest in organic strawberry fields. When they were really big fields, they, they worked the middle of the fields and, and um, ate a lot of the ligus bug, which is a serious pest. Now they have a related, um, or, uh, spe there's a related species of tree swallows that um, do use nest boxes. And anecdotally, farmer Dennis Tamura has said that when they show up, his flea beetle problem reduces quite a bit. And when they leave, he notices that flea beetles um, numbers go up and he's been noticing this for years and years. We <clears throat> do know there's some really um, detailed studies about bluebirds and, and vineyards and how when you put up boxes in vineyards, there's a lot more bluebirds live there, as you might imagine. And when you, they put experimental insects near the boxes, they eat a lot of them and can help to save vines from um, getting diseases. The birds are also really delightful. So while this, you know, this talk is focusing on the economic benefits, I didn't want to... Um, I'd be amiss not to mention how much they enrich our lives and um, and help the world function. And so it's important to support them for their own sake. So how do we do that? Well, birds need a habitat like we do. They need a place to sleep and eat and um, drink and and they they need to be out of the elements and they need some place that's safe. And so for, like for food, um, some birds need food 
nearer their nests than others. <laughs> the smaller birds, like chickadees and titmouse, um, they're only moving a few hundred feet in any one direction from their nests, whereas barn owls will range up to two miles. And that has to do with, they are feeding their chick, these, these chickadees are feeding uh, insects um, up to 150 times a day, whereas barn owls are just bringing in about six rodents a day or so. So they can go much farther to find those. And um, so, so these smaller birds, that's about four to six acres. And you can see with this chart, uh, that it depends uh, on the bird, um, but it's the prairie falcons and barn owls are moving much farther, and you can see with this chart, they are using a lot more acreage. <clears throat> Birds also need cover for when they're sleeping like this owl, and um, they're getting out of the elements. Um, <coughs> And if the thank you, if the bird is um, has a family in a nest box, it's good to have cover for the bird nearby because those parents aren't going to always be in the box and or foraging. They need a place to rest, and uh, so having cover for them is a good thing. And once the birds fledge, the fledglings are out the nest box. It's good to have cover near that box so that they aren't exposed to predators and it'll help them um, become more or learn to become more stealth um, at, as time goes on. So they also need water and I'm going to have some here. Uh, what timing? Um, and uh, for drinking, for keeping their feathers clean and if they're making mud nests, they need some mud around. There, um, so sources could be farm ponds or farm ditches, and if a farm's lucky enough to have creeks or rivers or wetlands, that's sources too. And um, we want those water sources to be as clean as possible for birds and the and the the people um, downstream, people and other organisms downstream. So if you're going to put up a bird box, it's good to know who you're going to invite and um, and know if they occur where you are located in. So Cornell Ornithology has a bunch of different websites and this one is all about birds.org where you when you click on their maps, there's two kinds of maps. And this one is a map, the range map has been, um, um, the, they've created this map over many, many years of data. Whereas, the one on the right is um, observations that are, are um, uploaded from eBird, a citizen's uh, science um, um, project that is showing us that these birds are actually a, a, a lot more than what we thought or occur a lot more places. So both maps are useful. Um, so bluebird, we use a bluebird box that has the right size hole for the bluebird. We put, uh, you can't really see this, you'll be able to see this later. We put in a, a hole guard um, to make sure that nobody can enlarge that hole. So it's perfect for bluebirds, but it's also perfect size for tree swallows and all of these birds too. And in our publication, there's a table that shows these different birds that use that size box. And it shows you a lot more. So what does it show for Western bluebirds? It, it talks about what pests, insects, or, or, or all kinds of insects they are eating and where to put the box. Like for bluebirds, they really like their nest boxes in grasslands with some scattered trees and or vineyards, et cetera. They're kind of territorial, so they have boxes have to be a couple hundred feet from each other. And what's interesting is that if you don't have a chance to pay attention to the nest box during the busy farming season, you can check it in the winter. And um, especially it's a good thing to check and clean out those boxes. You can tell who, which bird it is by looking at the nest that they built. So this um, bluebird is building this grass nest. Whereas for a chickadee, um, 
they are, they like a little more wooded, partially shaded location for their box. Put the boxes a little closer together and their nests are made of moss and lined with fur. Um, some of these are, are gorgeous. It, they look like it would be um, very comfortable. For nut hatches, they are an important collie moth um, predator. And um, they also like more wooded and areas and they are very territorial. So you can only put up a box every thousand feet or so. And their nest is, is pretty mixed up with a lot of different uh, materials. So you can see it's, it's distinctive um, to look at the different, or to be able to tell the nests are distinctive enough to be able to tell who's using the boxes. But I also said that um, nest, uh, birds will use nest shelves like this barn swallow, but also um, robins use them and says phoebes. And then uh, birds use eaves under buildings like the black phoebe, but also cliff swallows. And there are some concerns when placing boxes. One of the uh, tenants we um, like to share is it's better to never attract birds if their safety and that of their young is compromised. So um, cats can be a problem. And, and while you know, farmers have farm cats for um, dealing with rodents, um, we don't want to put boxes up and encourage birds um, anywhere near cats because they are really stealth. And they are, they'll pay attention and they'll every day come by that box and hear the chicks as they get bigger, they get noisier. And then they'll, one day the chicks will be calling from the, from the habitat outside when they've fledged. And anyways, it's a good idea not to put boxes up wherever cats are, whether it's the farm, your farm or neighbor's farm um, or farm buildings. Uh, there, there could be problems with compost and bird feeders because it draws rats and their predators. We also want to place boxes that in places that aren't, where there isn't a lot of human activity, where there's not a lot of people walking back and forth or noise, including dangerous roads. Um, and we want to make sure that the least toxic pesticides as possible are used if pesticides are used. And that's because insecticides reduce the amount of insects there and, and uh, the amount of food for the bird. So if there's nothing out there, they're not gonna come to the farm. Also herbicides reduce plants that support insects. And, um, and then there's the pesticide impacts themselves to the birds, which can cause um, harm and or death. If there are pesticides being used, it's really a good idea to angle the box away, the entrance hole of the box away from where the direct line of the spray would come from. And um, when using pesticides, we always have to be cautious. Another concern about placing the box has to do with the temperatures. We wanna orient box at easterly or northeasterly directions so that there, it's um, cooler, especially in the afternoon. And in really hot areas, it's a good idea to put boxes with afternoon shade, like near a tree that will give it some afternoon shade or large bushes. Could also paint the box in white and or um, attach some solar shields like you see here. And if it's cold, it's air in areas where there's a lot of wind, it's really good to orient the box away from prevailing wind. So I mentioned before, we need to maintain the box, which means we need to clean them out for a couple of reasons. There's parasites that can accumulate from and be there from year to year, um, reducing the health and um, success of nestlings. And, um, and as, if the nests don't get cleaned out, there'll be one nest built on top of another nest, on top of another nest, and pretty soon the chicks are right adjacent to the entrance hole, which is problematic because somebody like a crow can reach in and grab them, which they like to do. Um, so when to clean them out? Songbird nest boxes can still be cleaned out through 
January here on the coast. I think that's definitely true inland in California and 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 throughout uh, a lot of the U.S. Um, <clears throat> I um, have seen some bluebirds start to use nest boxes in early March or late February, and so that's why I said January. The um, Raptor boxes really should be cleaned out earlier. You could try and clean out boxes now, but if you find that their birds are building a new nest, do not disturb it. Just close it up and leave it for another year. Um, because barn owls will, they some have already started nesting and it just depends. Some won't start for another few months. So there are some threats to boxes and in, in our um, publication, we go over a bunch of these. There's uh, one of the um, designs that we have, what, that we use a lot is putting a, putting a box on a uh, EMT conduit metal pole. And sometimes we put these wobbling baffles to their guards so that cats and raccoons can't climb up or mice or squirrels or snakes. This is really great for all of those. Um, but sometimes you can, uh, if you, uh, if it's the best situation, you can hang them from trees. Hanging boxes is a lot better than nailing them to the um, tree itself because it's harder for predators to get to at them when they're uh, hanging. Like cats and raccoons are, aren't going to jump on this box because it will swing back and forth. Uh, mice and rats and squirrels might get on that box. The best thing to keep them out is to have an eave that comes out the front of the box and even you can make that eave even longer than these are about two or three inches and sometimes you can make them as long as five inches. Um, and then, you know, if there's snakes, you gotta move it to a pole, move the box to a pole. So, a um, a lot of times growers want to attach boxes to fences and that can be an okay thing to do but there's a more uh it's more possible that you're going to get predators it depends on the kind of fence a wooden fence is not as good as like a woven wire fence which is a little harder to climb and <clears throat> If it's a problem, can either try and put this null guard on the on the front of the box. This um, this this uh, discourages the birds from using the box, so you have to wait till they lay their eggs. And not everybody is paying that close attention. So there's that. You may just want to move the box onto a pole with a baffle if um, if you're finding that there's predators. And um, the same with mounting on a tree is really not a good idea. Some other threats to manage have to do with, um, well, with uh, hawks and jays and crows. Again, you can use this null guard after the eggs are laid um, to keep out bigger uh, birds and um, squirrels. Uh, as I mentioned, we can use this um, hole entrance, entrance hole guard. We can make them yourself. Uh, or buy them <clears throat> uh, in the resources section of the um, nesting structures uh, publication. We have lots of res resources that can, uh, where you can um, find things like this. And then managing house sparrows are non-native. So we encourage, um, we encourage everyone to not let them use the nest boxes. There can be paper wasps sometimes, and so you got to wait for cool weather to get them out of the nest box. Sometimes there's fire ants and diatomaceous earthworks. I've also just learned that cinnamon works on ants, which is a lovely thing to to know about. And um, and then for, we've had problems with bumblebees moving into boxes, but actually it's not. I don't think problem is the right word because anytime we are supporting native and native bumblebees, that's a that's a good thing to have. And so we just put up a different box in a nearby area. 
the here's another um website from Cornell Lab of Ornithology called Nest Watch. And in it, you can find nest um, box plans um, for all kinds of uh, bird species. Okay, I want to switch gears and talk for a few minutes about our habitat assessment tool. I'm going to cover landscape and farmscape um, influences and the opportunities uh, for um, supporting birds, not just with nest boxes, but with the kinds of habitat that Sam was talking about, and <clears throat> some farm management that makes diff a difference, and then the native plants themselves, and how we can prioritize their selection based on climate benefits, food, shelter, nesting, and um, yeah, for the birds. So this is a tool that is created in Excel and, and so that has all these uh, hidden functions and calculations and um, it's a scoring tool. So it helps you go through these different topics and then um, rates a before you do something and then after and sees, it helps you see the improvement. We also publish this guide, which is, related to the tool, which um, gives more background on our thinking on how to um, do the scoring and address different issues related to birds. And a happy um, outcome of that tool was creating this chart. It had all these hidden calculations that you could just put in a native plant and it would, and, and it would score it, but you didn't really know why. And so this is showing you for all of our these native plants that we love. There's a hundred and birds in different ways. So the tool has um, seven parts to it, the fluence for bird presence and opportunities for putting in farmscaping. And then the last four have to do with native plants. So in the landscape features, it rates like if, if around the farm, if there's if there's um, very little or a lot of um, natural and semi-natural habitat. And as you could imagine, this is a, a lot. And, and with this native habitat nearby, there's going to be a lot more birds that would move in if you put in a hedgerow um, into the farm or a nest box. And this, there wouldn't be so much. What, what who... Uh, a bird that would likely use a, um, a, a farm like this would be a barn owl. Um, you could put up a box and they would probably come, but um, depending on what is surrounding, they too are influenced by uh, what's around more. They're more likely to use boxes that have habitat too, but they can go farther to get food. We also rate, um, the landscape, whether it's native or invasive, and there's more points for native. Then in the second section on farmscaping features, there's more points for connectivity, um, more points for taller, <clears throat> taller um, hedgerows or wider hedgerows. Um, there's more points for quiet areas versus um, you probably, if you were a bird, you wouldn't want to build a nest next to this. Um, you'd want to be in a quiet, uh, on a quiet road, not Highway 5. And maybe this hedgerow on Highway 5 would support some pollinators fine um, and or beneficial insects, but birds are likely not going to nest someplace so noisy. We already talked about how they need water resources and that gets rated um, and there's different kinds of water resources. They, there's <clears throat> also points for putting up perches. It can be man-made perches and or you can grow them like sunflowers. And we talked about nesting structures and pesticides, that's all getting rated. And then promoting biodiversity uh, by managing your farm to have smaller diversity fields helps increase bird diversity. <clears throat> so does flowers and pastures and cover crops. <clears throat> and then we need to talk about encouraging coexistence because birds 
and or habitat all um, have some things we have to um, deal with that aren't always good. Like birds in the spring, there are some birds like blackbirds in the spring, lots of pest insects, but later on might cause some crop damage. There's also fire fuel management issues where um, you might have to hardscape or you, depending on where you are, hardscape your, your um, buildings and um, have defensible space, but keep some diversity in the, um, on the farm too. And then food safety. Food, there's um, been some really good studies recently on birds and food safety and showing how they carry very few foodborne pathogens, uh, especially <coughs> low on the ones that are um, affecting bird or people. And um, excuse me, the uh, one of our videos, uh, we have um, a whole slew of videos on our resources uh, section of our website, and one is called don't have to be afraid of birds. And in it, we talk about how um, <clears throat> when a farm supports a diverse bird community, there's less crop damage, there's less food safety, and there's more avian pest control. And so the more um, diverse the farm is, the more diverse the bird community, the better the outcome. Now at um, the... Um, the last part of the tool, we pick plants, uh, what was there before and after, and the tool rates it using um, these different characteristics like climate, the plants that have a long, better range, a bigger range than uh, a smaller will get rated better. Plants that store more carbon are rated better. Plants that are year round and provide habitat that in times of Climate stress, um, which is happening more and more, I get rated better. We use um, data from Calscape, Calflora, USDA. And um, we also use, uh, we are created or mined a whole bunch of data from um, uh, Cornell's Birds of the World, where um, they have thousands of studies about birds, and we looked for the uh, plants, the birds that were eating. We were using plants for different um, characteristics, whether it was in their breeding or non breeding range, and um, in food for food and for nesting. <clears throat> we also looked at characteristics like, like plants um, providing food in four seasons versus three seasons versus two seasons. And um, if plants were providing caterpillars, like very many caterpillars with willows, <clears throat> this ocean spray had many caterpillars and bladder pod bush, just some. That data comes from Calscape and <clears throat> all the moths and butterflies using native plants. And um, they worked with Doug Tal Dr. Doug Tallamy and he's been studying this and um, uh, caterpillars as bird food for years. Um, so there's that bird food. There's a bird report that comes out with that. And um, finally, this score, there's a before and after score that comes uh, um, as a final thing for using the tool. So by supporting birds and all the ways that they are uh, foraging, you can have a diverse bird community that helps in lots of different ways with very little um, uh, issues with them, like very little food safety issues or crop damage issues. <clears throat> so um, in summary, we, we covered about which nest boxes birds or which birds are using nest boxes and where to place them, how to manage them, how to manage threats, uh, the landscape and farmscape influences, managing farms to be safer and more supportive of birds and the different uh, native plants that we can select. So as I mentioned in our resource page of our website, there's lots of materials, including there's a hedgerow uh, video 
that you can watch um, that Sam is featured in. And um, this is our bird platform you can check out. And there is my um, contact information. It looks like I'm just standing on the hour. <clears throat> So I'm sorry, I kind of uh, packed it in there, but I could stay on and answer a couple of questions in case, uh, or how about if I answered uh, just two questions and and because I know people probably have to go. Oh, Shelly has a survey actually, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind filling out these four questions, it really helps us um, figure out how, we're, how did we do with this presentation? How, um, uh, and other, uh, there's just four questions, um, and anything you want to share, you can, you can, um, put that in there for us. So thank you for that. And, um, while we may not get to all of the questions, I know we're really good at answering them for you later. So, um, we can, uh, we'll do that if, um, We'll just send out an email, I think, or Shelly, how does that work? Yeah, we can, if we don't get to all the questions, um, we can answer them uh, via email when we send out the recording link. Yeah. Okay, do you want me to launch into a couple of these? I think sure. they're pretty quick. Um, one was how tall should the raptor perches be? Do you have a, a height for that? I think it's, I want to say 12 to 15, but how about we answer that question? <clears throat> Cause I, I want to make sure I'm right. We can, we'll, we'll send out an email and, and answer that correctly. I do know there, it depends uh, on where there are some places that are better than others to, to locate them. It's better to put them on top of a hill instead of um, the bottom. Cause they, can see more and if, if you have hilly terrain and it's also better not to put them right next to a tree because they're going to use a tree instead. Great. Yeah. Um, another question was about cats and using um, cat collars. Do Are those helpful in, in helping to keep birds safe when there are cats around? Yeah. If you have cats. Yeah. That's a good question. I have seen a couple of studies that show these not these cat collars, they kind of look like clown collars. They stick out all the way around and they're really colorful. Birds are keyed in to color um, and they work pretty well. I don't know if they're a hundred percent, but they're way better than not using them. So I would definitely recommend that if you um, have cats around. Great. Um, let's see. The next question is, is uh, do you have any tips to mitigate crop damage from blackbirds in the fall? Well, there are definitely a lot of um, ways to discourage birds. I think the, uh, you know, the, the most effective is using netting, but that's the most expensive. And, and it may not be cost effective if you're if your crop isn't worth um, worth all the time and a late, the labor and uh, cost of it, but <clears throat> but you can use um, visual um, distractions um, uh, and or like um, that that tape that um, uh, silver tape that blows in the wind. I wouldn't put leave it up year round though because it discourages birds when. Your, uh, when you want them to be around. Um, yeah, there's, uh, thank you. There's a, um, a sound, um, <clears throat> I forget what it's called, but it makes um, distress calls of birds. And that seems to work pretty well, but you got to move it around a lot. Um, yeah, I know there's others. Uh, I think that it, sometimes people will drive around and, and make um, uh, with sound cannons. <clears throat> sometimes neighbors don't like those. It's really, um, um, can be obnoxious. Yeah. Great. So um, 
I was just going to say the trick is not to do any one thing, except for unless you're going to use netting, you got to switch it up and move things around so that they're, um, yeah, they uh, get used, they won't get used to it. Great. Um, one other question that just came in um, was about um, how some vineyard managers are concerned with birds spreading vine mealybugs. And um, what are some ways, if any, that uh, this could be prevented and ease concerns? The birds, <clears throat> sorry, the birds are spreading vine mealybug? That is what the question um, Sarah, I don't know if Sarah's still on, but if I can unmute her, if um, if she is, I don't see that she is still on. Um, mm. We might, yeah. I don't know. I haven't heard that. I mean, um, I don't know how how they would spread vine mealybugs. Um, you would think I could have see how they would eat them. Um, but spreading them would mean that they're in their feathers or something. I mean, these birds are eating insects. So I think they try and eat all the insects that came, they came, came upon, but uh, I'll have to learn more about that. Yeah. Sarah is still on. So yeah, I'm here. Hi there. Big fan. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah. So I uh, work for a vineyard management company in Monterey County and um we have these like round table meetings with our managers um, on vine mealybug because that's like our one of our number one pests of concern. And uh, they so we try to use a lot of organic um, biological methods of pest control. Like we use pheromone, pheromone traps and uh, and lures and that kind of keeps the, the males, which are mobile, um, from finding the females, which kind of just like sit there on like um on on the vines but i guess that uh birds when they land on on um on vines they will pick up these these female and they're, they're kind of sticky mm -hmm. and um, they can fly and land onto other uh vines you know and, and just spread them around um but they're very tiny little insects and i don't think birds eat them hmm yeah well, <clears throat> I could imagine you're right. If they're really sticky, they could, the birds could be spreading them. Um, it sounds like we need to study that more though, because yeah, it just depends. I know birds are really good at finding little things that we don't even notice. There's, there's studies that show how quickly birds can find um, insects and seeds uh, that that when people try and do that, they don't even see them. So, um, but that's just you know they've evolved to do that. But but it's possible. But depending on the bird, you know, like a really big bird probably wouldn't necessarily see that vine mealy bug, whereas a smaller one that is used to eating smaller prey might. Um, yeah. So. Um, I can yeah. share that with some of the researchers I work with and see if any of them know uh, more about this. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Should I, I leave my email in the, the comment section? Yeah, yeah, please do. Okay, thank you. All right, um, Shelly, is that about it? Well, there was one more question if you have time for it. Oh, sure. <laughs> Um, do you know if a uh, barn or tree swallows eat, or any other birds, I guess, eat wasps um, because the wasps are um, uh, destroying this person's table grapes? Um, so do you know if any birds are predators of, of the wasps? Yes, um, we have some beautiful photos of birds eating wasps. So um, I don't know that it's um, I don't know this exact species of wasps they're eating, but I know that birds will eat them. Which birds? Um, songbirds, I'm thinking of. Um, not so much, not raptors. So, um, yeah, and and uh, I, I didn't mention, but there's a lot of historical data where 
in a uh, hundred years ago, you, the, the USDA, our precursor to USDA called economic ornithology, asked farmers to shoot birds, mail them in, and they looked at 80,000 bird stomachs. And I know wasps were found in those stomachs. So um, yeah, they, they eat them. All right. Well, thank you everyone. Thank you, Shelly, for helping with those. Um, questions and thank you Sam for um participating in this event and um we oh I don't know how that's working uh there we go we are uh so happy you joined us and hope you have a good rest of your day and a nice holiday thanks everyone bye